Cisco. Extracting the signal from the noise, it's the Cube. Covering VMworld 2015. Brought to you by VMware and its ecosystem sponsors. Now your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Hello everyone, welcome back. This is theCUBE live in San Francisco for day three of coverage of VMworld 2015. Again, live in San Francisco at Moscone North Lobby, right off the street. I'm John Furrier with SiliconANGLE. I'm joined by my host, Dave Vellante. This is kicking off day, day three segments. We have two days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Go to youtube.com slash siliconangle or siliconangle.tv for all the videos. We have special guests on this kickoff. George Gilbert, uh, senior analyst, and we'll keep on on big data. Guys, uh, Dave, uh, big night last night. Obviously, uh, it was a circuit party for you know, all the action. VMworld's really known for their you know, engagement, their communities, interactions, but also they're known for all their parties. And certainly tonight, the super party uh, at AT&T Park. But we learn a lot at these parties. <laughs> People love to talk. And we love to listen, so we got there, pound the pavement, getting the scoop. Um, and are interesting, a lot of venture capital parties, so you got a lot of startups here, trying to, um, uh, VCs trying to find the startups. But certainly, really the post Gelsinger day yesterday, really about VMware, the future of VMware, what's going on with EMC, the Federation, a lot of conversation around the ecosystem. Everyone's engaged, I mean, it, it's kind of a lot of storage focus, but again, it's a free for all on the floor there, ton of activity. It seems like people are waiting. It's like the calm before the storm, we're in the eye of the hurricane, some stuff's going to happen. We're in this ecosystem, a lot of transformation. Dave, what's your take on what you learned last night on theCUBE? Yeah, Share so last, last night we were at Lightspeed, uh, hit Highland Capital, uh, Kleiner Perkins, Sequoia. We meet, met a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of VCs. I'll say this, there's investments and innovation going on in virtually every part of the stack, and surprisingly, including storage, because you figure, okay, who needs another all-flash array company, but there are several you know, in stealth. But also, a lot of activity around security and networking, tons and tons and tons of investment going into those spaces, and also still tons into cloud management. So, you know, it was good. And then, as well, George, a lot of big data action going on. Uh, we saw, you know, numerous people. We saw Ben Werther out last night. We saw uh, Stefan from Datamere. Bunch of folks in the Hadoop and big data community. Not that this is a Hadoop and big data show, but everybody's here, you know, and it's close. So, we wanted to have this special segment with you, George, to sort of catch up on what you're seeing in the space. You know, special big data segment here at VMworld 2015. So give us the update. What are you What are you hearing on the ground? You've been focusing on Spark versus Hadoop. You, you know, Hadoop 3.0. You've been talking to the practitioners, the technologists. What's your take on what's going on? So, if I were to sort of uh, make the uh, draw an evolution of da uh, big data um, on this infrastructure and how and uh, sort of in stages, Hadoop 1.0 was, you know, M M MapReduce. We all know that. And um, you, we built higher level things on MapReduce to hide its complexity, but you could only do one thing at a time. It was the DOS era. It was pretty low level. So, C prompt. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, with, with Yarn and HDFS, we had enough of a platform where we could have multiple compute engines working. We could have an Impala for, you know, uh, sort of MPP SQL query. Um, we could have uh, machine learning going on. We could have essentially multiple applications working on the same data. What has been less clear is what Hadoop 3.0 is going to look like. And I think those, um, those threads are beginning to come together where um, Yarn will grow up from something that just allocates hardware resources to something that can also manage workloads. One of the sort of secret sauces and best kept secrets within Oracle is that you can run queries um, that are optimized for performance, but also that have like hundreds of other people competing for the Oracle resource, and it can manage that. The what's left over resource. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and the so you're talking mesos, about the quality of service, yes. if you will, for the main yes. app, and then okay, everybody yeah. else can go fight over it. Well, you know. but it's also, there's the, it's which apps get how much in terms of processor and memory, things like that, but then there's the other layer, which is how many, um, uh, how each user, based on their role and their priority, how much of the workload gets distributed to them within the application, and then between apps. So you're running Oracle, and you might be running a stream processor, mm -hmm. and how do you keep everyone sort of happy? That's now uh, a layer that's becoming a, a sort of 
either um, Yarn V2 or Mesos. And you're saying that's a, a harbinger of what we're going to see in Hadoop 3.0? Um, as a Hadoop 3.0, as a collection of capabilities, that would be the new foundation um, in terms of resource management. So it's really kind of like an operating system, like Windows manages, you know, all the workloads within all the applications that are cooperating. Then, right now, HDFS is kind of limited as a storage medium because, you know, it's you can only add stuff, so it's sort of like an archive. But, and it's also pretty much disk-based. Disk but we want to have a performance tier that's in RAM, and we also want to have uh, sort of a higher performance kind of storage tier like the like our, our analyst uh, uh, David Floyer talks about, which is um, sort of large flash but high speed. Um, Low latency. Yes, okay. So now, but Low, doesn't so Spark memory bring that? intensive. Well, that's the thing. Some people think Spark will choke on the fact that it, it needs so much RAM, and then when it doesn't, it spills to disk and gets really slow. But if you have a richer storage tier where you have both RAM and this low latency um, persistent storage as well as traditional disk, then things like Spark and others can become uh, much more um, cost effective in very, very large scales. That's, those, are the, those are the first two layers. Then the third layer is we've got all these different vectors going off where we can have, um, we have the MPP SQL databases, we have these document databases like Mongo, we have these stream processing um, things because whether it's the Internet of Things or whether we want analytics to happen really, really fast, not store it in the database and then do something with it. Um, so this next layer that's coming together is putting together the storage where you could have like key value and tables that you would get from HBase, the files that you would have from HDFS++, and uh, a doc database like MongoDB. That would all be integrated in one layer. Then you would have um, your choice of sort of streaming or storage. And then on another layer, you would pick your poison for term, for, in terms of analytics, whether you want machine learning, whether you want SQL, you know. So you have all these three things integrated. Then on top of the storage layer and with this resource mediation, or, uh, you put those three together, you have a platform that customers can sort of essentially go to their database vendors and say, okay, you're good for the transaction processing, we're not going to do that here, but... Everything else? Yes. But you're talking about totally reinventing the, the big data stack. Um, I'm talking about evolving it. Not okay, so it's not reinventing it. No. All right. Be so, uh, specific. It's, what vendors now are are doing uh, that? Well, Who's reinventing what? Well, what how I does that relate to VMworld? Okay, um, it re it it relates to VMworld in the sense that um, we need sort of infrastructure of a, as a service to make that work. Mm -hmm. You know, because we have to abstract out the co the complexity of running the clusters. Well, it also relates and in the sense that guys like Amazon, as you pointed out to me, George, are <clears throat> building that end-to-end -end data management stack and yes. delivering it as a service. Yes. And that is a killer within, within, offering. Within the infrastructure. Within everything that, from with, infrastructure with, as a service yeah. all the way through platform as a service. Yes. And that is the, 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 how does VMware and others compete with that? Okay, here's my take. Um, so someone like a VMware, maybe OpenStack, uh, maybe you know IBM with SoftLayer, mm. if they can manage that infrastructure as a real service like Amazon does it, and then you have the software vendors like a MapR. MapR is really bringing these software layers together, but you'll see, you know, you'll see it coming from others. I think you'll see it coming together from them for an on-premise offering. If you put that on top of the VMware-style infrastructure. And if MapR can manage it as a service, you're going to see uh, essentially the TCO that you might get in the cloud, but without the proprietary lock-in that you would get in the cloud. <laughs> okay, so now <clears throat> let's come back to Spark v Hadoop. When, okay. when Spark came out, you guys did the Spark Summit. There was a lot of excitement around Spark. IBM, put, uh, I think they did a, their billion-dollar play or playbook, or maybe yep, maybe yep. not. I can't remember now. But yeah, they put well. a lot of effort and resource into Spark. Some people said, "Oh, IBM's just doing that to kill it," you know. But <laughs> but um, you, George, got very excited and said, "Hmm." You you actually made the point to me is you know maybe Dave, <coughs> excuse me, 
uh, Hadoop needs Spark more than Spark needs Hadoop. And we sort of had that conversation. What's your take now, having gone out and talked to people, maybe getting some, some arrows <laughs> thrown at you, yeah. uh, shot at you, what's your take Give us a sort of view of the Spark versus Hadoop, where does it fit debate? What, I'm what I talked about in terms of these three layers, storage, um, sort of resource scheduling and mediation, and then the um, application analytics on top, Spark fits in that in the sense that um, you can have one engine that does your machine learning, your streaming, your graph processing, SQL, um, all on the same data set and it's a single application model. It can rest on the mediation layer, whether it's Yarn or even more sophisticated, Mesos. Um, and it can rest on a storage layer, though, that has to evolve somewhat from HDFS, just like the broader Hadoop v3 I was talking about. We need a, we need, um, a smart storage layer so that Yarn, uh, I'm sorry, so Spark knows where to move data around when you're doing the analysis. So a couple other little things we're hearing this week, John. So we, we, uh, the rumor was floating around that Microsoft was going to buy Docker, <coughs> and supposedly that deal's done because Ben, you know, they couldn't agree on a price because the price was too damn high. So good way to go, Docker. Just you know, <laughs> stay private. Um, so word is now they're going after Mesos. And that, the, that's intel. Uh, yeah. That's because if you look at Mesos and uh, if Microsoft does, you know, some interesting work on storage then they can lay claim to the foundation of the next generation sort of data center operating system. And that makes Microsoft extremely relevant in that space, right. doesn't it? Well, right. I mean, also, Microsoft needs to have a play here, and that's bottom line. Docker is going for, they have too much traction in my mind. Docker is going to be the winner, in my opinion, not just because I like the company and, and like what they've done, but their lead is significant. Their mind share, their developer traction is significant. But that doesn't mean there's room for other guys. Categories being created, there's going to be a number two and number three. Well, I agree with you. I mean, I love CoreOS, love Alex, but I mean, Docker's got, got a lead. They've got you know, the, the market momentum. They've got the mind share and I just. The CoreOS, I mean, I was talking with Alex last night at uh, Kleiner Perkins' party um, with CoreOS, and you know, I'm a huge fan of CoreOS. Been on the Cube, he's been on the Cube. Here's the problem that they have. They're running really hard right now, super hot. They're scaling up. They're looking for engineers. They got basically an open ticket item. Any engineer they are trying to hire so fast, um, they're growing really, really fast. At the same time, there's a lot of pressure coming at them. M&A pressure. Everyone wants to, you know, do a reach around on them. Everyone wants to grab them. They're the they're the bride right now that everyone wants to to dance with because Docker saying, no, no, we're we're going alone. So that's a lot of pressure for an entrepreneur and team. So so I, you know, I said, look at put up the heat shield. You got to protect yourself and still run the creative product development. They have to go faster, and I think that's the biggest challenge with CoreOS, in my opinion, is do they just blow up by running too hot? But right now they're looking very good, and I think it's a great. Well, that's your point. There's definitely room for for you know number two. There's always a room for an alternative. But no, 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 but the pressure, the market pressure for an emerging startup is really hard to grow a company really fast and not you know self-induced blow up. Um, that's the only thing that's going to stop CoreOS, in my opinion. CoreOS is solid, and with Docker's traction, there's totally that love-hate relationship so, going so, on between but, the two. But, but, we're running out of time, so the bottom line, Spark v. Hadoop. Spark kills Hadoop, Hadoop you know, evolves, there's a coexistence, what's your take? You know, I don't think it'll, it'll kill Hadoop, but there will be uh, a certain class of, a certain class of uh, customers, um, the most sophisticated and potentially also uh, the smaller ones where um, integrated, um, on, on the high end, where you can take advantage of, of features that sort of reinforce each other that no one else can offer. And on the lower end, simplicity of having them one package where it's very compelling. But they, it's likely to involve uh, some amount of the sort of Hadoop V3 infrastructure that can exist separately from it. Databricks doesn't really require the, you know, the Hadoop infrastructure itself, but you'll see a Venn diagram where there is some overlap, um, and you'll see situations where the Hadoop vendors say, oh yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll run Spark, you know, as a job, and, and you'll see the, the Databricks guys, you know, and perhaps IBM as well, say, 
you know, you can run it self-contained. All right, let's wrap, John. Give us some predictions, you know, what do you, <laughs> based on what you've seen here this week, you know, and then we'll wrap Yeah, up. we've got a long day today, but we want to kick off this, wrap up this segment by saying, look, at, we were on the streets last night, pounding the pavement, I was ear to the ground, listening to all the, the conversations, and everyone's got their side of the story, what they want to promote, a lot of people promoting their agendas, but here's the bottom line. We predicted on SiliconANGLE, I predicted on theCUBE, that EMC would not allow a reverse takeover. I'm still maintaining that prediction that EMC will create a new version of itself, maybe shed some product divisions off to uh, the HPs of the world that, that really have good synergies, doing some M&A, and VMware comes back in. You're, fe you're predicting Federation 2.0. I'm predicting <laughs> that VMware is so powerful that if, the, if EMC, you said this yesterday, I'm borrowing your line, is too powerful for EMC to give up. And I think that legacy of the Federation is key. And, and this Elliott Capital is the Gordon Gecko. Uh, modern hedge funds, he's evil. And think about the damage that would happen if he raids that company. Thousands of jobs lost in Massachusetts. Hopkins would be a ghost town. I just don't see the individuals who run EMC, they're tough. They're not going to let that happen. So in my opinion, I think you're going to see EMC reborn, rebooted, pivoted, whatever you want to call it, in a whole new way with VMware at the center. I just don't see VMware. But so that story doesn't end there, right? Because the, 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 Gordon Gecko's not going to go away. But all right, Well, no, lighting a fire under someone's butt is one thing, but coming in and taking down the company just over short-term gain, I don't think EMC will let that happen. The founders and the, the DNA of that company is, is, uh, is resilient. And then obviously the startup scene, Docker versus CoreOS, that is going to be a real battle. Um, and then on the big data side, you're seeing big data conversation here at VMworld, but from an IT ops perspective, I think you're going to see the developer piece got a big, big part of next year, where it's real developers, where infrastructure as code is going to be the DevOps ethos. And then you're going to start to see the end-to-end -end architecture. And I think that's what the new EMC is going to look like. They're going to come out looking more and more like Oracle, more and more like an engineered system end-to-end -end with cloud to compete ultimately with Amazon. So, and big data is going to be sprinkled all throughout that fabric. It's that next layer. It's that next layer. Again, we're breaking it down here inside theCUBE. Day three, uh, we're kicking off. We've got long, we have two sets. We have our director set, our new innovation. Go to siliconangle.com and wikibon.com for the free research and subscribe to some of the cutting edge research over there. And of course, siliconangle.tv where all the videos are. And we're going to be more live from San Francisco after this short break.